And, and when I say I'm doing well, and I'm not dismissing the people who are suffering and, and who have experienced deaths in their family due to this pandemic, but, um, but that's the, you know, that's the truth behind it is that there's always several parts of the world who are not doing well all the time. You know, um, you know, there are war zones and, and natural disasters and, uh, political unrest and you name it. Um, and we do a do it. I beg your pardon. And we are going to do a do it. We are going to do a do it. I can't yeah, we are. And, the, and the, what happens in the do it is very simple. I reach out here and then I mute myself. Then you have whatever time you want. And then after that, whenever whatever happens, I will bring in a story that was inspired by your story. And then we move on for it well, about 35, 40 minutes. So that's what's going to happen. Right. And when you tell the story that you're going to tell inspired by the story I'm going to tell after that, we have a conversation or I talk about um, I I, I, what I understand is that the third segment. Yeah. Well, it's actually changed a little bit because when, when we had this in the beginning, it was more like um, you told the story because you're the guest. Then I tell a story and then I told the story that I prepared from home. But I've stopped doing that because it was like, why change the subject? It's much more of, of just easy to follow the line. When you tell a story, then inspired by that, I tell a story, then inspired by that, you tell a story. So it's more like a conversation. It's more right. like we just we just have this kind of when you sit there with your friends talking and then suddenly, yeah, that reminds me of, of whatever. So I, you yeah. have the words now. I muted myself, right? So I go. You don't need to mute yourself. You don't need to mute yourself unless a train is going to go by or something, but, um, or at least, boy. Oh, okay. So <laughs> if, if something happens with the sound, please let me know with this hand signal. Yeah. And, um, so this is very relaxed. So my name is Antonio Hosha. For those who are listening on Facebook, I believe everybody's on Facebook if they are going to come, right? Nobody comes to the zoom, correct? Nobody comes to the zoom. It's on Facebook. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So for those who are on Facebook, my name is Antonio Hosha, and I live in Maine in the United States. Uh, Maine is actually the closest part of the United States from where our dear friend is here. Uh, Sven is in Denmark, right? Yes. And uh, did I pronounce your name uh, correct? Sven is good. Yeah. Yeah. But how do you, how, how do you say it? Um, I actually <clears throat> started saying that my name is Sven Eric because it's, it's Sven Eric. Okay. Yeah. Sven -Eric. okay, so Sven Eric is in Denmark, a country I've been to many times, but uh, most of the time just to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Copenhagen is a beautiful city. Uh, and so I come from Brazil. I live in the United States. I've been here for 31 years now, but I come from brazil and i tell lo lots of folk tales and animal tales and some mythology and some personal stories stories from my childhood and what i'd like to do today is tell uh, is to tell a story from my childhood okay so here we go i will give you a little bit of background and then we go from there but um i grew up in a big city in Brazil, big, big, big city called Rio de Janeiro. Okay, I grew up right across the bay from it, um, and um, the Rio metropolitan area with over 15 million people, and it's a big, bustling city. And we moved to this area when I was five years old. Uh, we had to move from the countryside, a tiny little town. We moved from this tiny little town to the big city when I was five. All my siblings are women, and they are all older than I am. And they all had been brought up in the countryside. 
free to ride bicycles, go running around, and, and have all the freedom the countryside brings. But I, at age five, had to be in an apartment in a big city. So my mom did not like that at all. So what she would do is always take me back to my hometown, and that's where all her brothers and her sister live. My uncles and my aunt lived in the small town where I had been born and lived for five years. So she would take me there, and then uh, when I was old enough, she would drop me there with her sister, and I would spend summer vacation. And then I got old enough in my... Um, early teens, uh, when I was 12, 13, I could just go by myself, you know? And all the major things that I learned outside, I learned in my hometown, not in the big city. Where do you think I learned how to ride a bicycle? Not in Rio. I learned in my hometown with my cousins. That's where I learned. Where do you think I started to fish? Uh, in the creek that ran through my hometown with my cousins. That's where I did. Now, one particular summer vacation was etched in my memory for the rest, has been etched in my memory for the rest of my life. And that was the year one of my uncles, Uncle Pepe, went to the Amazon. <laughs> One's got to do what one's got to do in order to save one's family. Oh, I'll get to that in a few minutes. Uncle Pepe was a bon vivant. He was a larger than life human being. He loved everything big. I think he, a good place for him would be Texas. But he lived in this small little town in the countryside. And everything had to be big. And he was this loud human being. And that particular year, he had gone to the Amazon, the largest rainforest in the world. And in order for him to go to this rainforest, mind you, he had to go to Rio to catch a flight. And this is how far away it was. He would ride a bus for five hours to Rio, then get on a cab to the airport, and then fly another three to four hours to the Amazon. I'm talking about very far away. A lot of people think the whole country of Brazil is the Amazon. No, the Amazon is on the north part of Brazil. So I grew up very far away from the Amazon. I grew up in a completely different type of jungle, a jungle of concrete. And so my uncle did this whole thing, took the bus, took the cab, took the plane, and went to the Amazon. And when he came back, he wouldn't shut up about it. Everything was stories about the Amazon. He told about how the river was so wide, seven miles wide during the dry season. And, and the forest went on forever. And the river went on forever. And the animals, everything was big in the Amazon. And all the anacondas, 20 feet long. The piranhas will eat you up in one minute. I mean, everything is fast. Everything is big. And the caimans, he wouldn't quiet down about the caimans. These are the black caimans. They are like Amazon's alligators. And there are thousands of them, thousands. And my uncle would go around in the evening to go for a night fish, fishing trip, and you'd see all of the red beady eyes. And so he brought home everything caiman, everything alligator. He brought home a tiny dried up baby alligator. Yeah, the one that you put on the bookshelf. He brought that. He brought home uh, for himself a nice alligator hat. I know this is really politically incorrect. It is a terrible thing for the environment. But this is how the story goes. He had an alligator hat. He had alligator gloves. He had alligator boots. He had alligator belt. He had his prized possession an alligator jacket. I mean, the alligator jacket was designed so that the scales would stick out like this. I mean, the main scales of the alligator across his back, and when he would put it on for us kids, he would go like so and like so, and he looked like a dinosaur. He looked like a dinosaur. He would wear his alligator jacket. Now, guess what he had in the backyard of his house? 
a real alligator. He built himself a well that was eight feet across, and it was deep enough for the six-foot-long gator to stay in there. And the design was that it was about three to four feet deep, the water, so the alligator could not climb out. And we kids, and now I was just about 12 at the time, would run to his backyard to look at this alligator. It was the first time seeing this alligator, you know, right there in the well. The thing would be just looking at us, and sometimes we would get there, and it would be completely gone at the bottom of the well. And then it was feeding time. Oh, 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 when it was feeding time, even kids who are not related to us came to his backyard to watch my uncle feed chunks and chunks of meat to this gator, and the gator would come out, and water would be splashing all over us, and we're like, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again, and he'd feed and feed the alligator. It was something out of this world. And then his wife would open the kitchen door, and she'd look at him with all the kids around the well, and he would say, and she would say, você tira esse jacaré daí. Pepe, tira esse jacaré daí. Uma das crianças vão cair aí dentro e depois o jacaré vai buscar, vai pegar ele. Você tira esse jacaré daí, porque a enchente vai chegar, a enchente vai chegar e o jacaré vai sair e vai pegar a gente. Você tira esse jacaré daí, Pepe! She would go crazy. And what that meant, what I just told you, is that she would ask him to take the alligator out of the backyard because one of the kids would fall in there and the alligator would just eat the kid or the floods would come from the creek, the flood, and the alligator would swim out in the flood, come in the house and get one of her kids in the house. Now, he would laugh, a big laugh, Calm down, dear, calm down. Nobody's going to fall in the well. I mean, it was pretty high above the ground, the well, so you couldn't, unless you jumped in, you couldn't fall in. But you know what? My aunt had a very strong reason to fear the floods. One thing I know that I haven't told you about my hometown is that it's set in a valley with a creek where I learned how to fish, running right through it. And it didn't have to rain in the valley in order for the creek to flood. All it needed to do was rain up on the foot, on the, on the top of the mountains, and the water would cascade down into the valley. You know, it is known as a flash flood. It would hit the creek, and the creek would flood, and half the town many times would be underwater. Okay, and my mom used to tell me this story. My mom grew up in my hometown and um, she lived there in her teens actually. And she remembers vividly when she was 14 years old, one day that the guard would be running through the neighborhoods with a bell going, flash flood, flash flood. And that's uh, in Portuguese, we say tromba d'agua. That's the word in Portuguese for flash flood. Tromba is an elephant's trunk and agua means water. So you can picture a lot of water coming at once. And he'd be running, this is a long time ago, when my mom was 14, you know? If mom was alive, she would be 97 this year. So for, when she was 14, it was a long time ago. And, and, and the guard would be coming down, ringing the bell, ringing the bell, flash, flood, tromba d'agua, tromba d'agua. And she remembers when she was 14, she stepped off her bed and her feet went in water in her room. The house was already flooded when she woke up to the bell. So my mom said every once, you know, every, every century, a couple times a century, there's a classic flood. And that's my, the fear that my aunt had, that a flood like that would come into the yard, the alligator would swim out and get one of the kids in the house. Well, summer vacation came to an end and it was time for me to get on the bus and go back to Rio and start school. And that's when it hit. Her fear came to life. 
a classic flood. It poured and poured and poured and poured, and it hit it right in the middle of the night. I mean, chaos, chaos. The creek flooded more than it had in the past. Houses that had not been flooded before got flooded. I mean, my uncle is running around the house with water up his shin. He's running around. It's nighttime. My aunt is picking up the kids, my cousins. You know, some of them were just little kids, and she's carrying them. My uncle is fishing for the paperwork, all the documents, birth certificate. You know, there is none of this stuff online back in those days. You know, if you lost a document, it would be months before you could get a, another one back. And so he's going through, the, picking up the case with the documents and the water is pushing the door open and water is coming in and the, the lights are flickering, the lights are flickering, you know, and all of a sudden they go out, the power is gone and just a little bit of moonlight is coming through. And just as they are almost ready to evacuate, my aunt is in the living room with furniture floating around, okay? There's furniture floating around in the living room and she sees it. She sees the gator moving inside her house. She freaked out, yelled, Jacare, 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 which means alligator, alligator, alligator. My uncle dropped everything he had, got his shotgun, came into the living room, saw the leathery thing, and <laughs> one's gonna do what one's gonna do in order to save one's family. And they evacuated. They evacuated and they went to higher ground to where his other brother lived, who was actually the storyteller of the family. He's no longer with us, and, uh, but he was quite the jokester. And he lived on, on higher ground than uh, Chio Pepe lived. And the whole family was there. His house was big enough. Everybody was there to camp out and then clean up the next day. And my Chio Pepe is boasting how he was the hero. <laughs> I shot the alligator and my aunt goes, you're no hero. You cannot claim to be a hero when you bring the trouble to your family yourself. Big laughter, big laughter, right? And then as flash floods do, they come, destroy, and then they go away. And the next morning, the sun was shining and it was time to clean up. And what a mess it was. Picture this. You've probably seen pictures and videos of it on television. Mud up, three feet up the walls, furniture that did not move out of the house with the receding of the waters trapped on the doorways. Everything's turned upside down. Everything is covered in mud. And my aunt is in the house crying cleaning up, my uncle's in the house, quietly cleaning up. The kids are like bugged eyed the bigger kids who could help. They're just looking around, everything is destroyed. And my uncle is picking up the stuff that he could salvage, but he's picking stuff up and looking around because you know what he's doing. He's looking for the body of that alligator, right? But he's not in the house. So he goes to the kitchen door and he looks towards the backyard, and there it is. Resting against a tree trunk is that leathery thing. And he runs towards it, and when he gets there, he burst out laughing. <laughs> hey, everybody, everybody, come down here. Look, look at what I got. And he reaches down, picks up this leathery thing, and puts it up in the air and says, look, I managed to shoot my alligator jacket instead. And there was his prized possession, completely destroyed, but not the alligator. That alligator was way smarter than anybody cared to think about. 
as soon as the flood waters from the creek entered the well and flooded the yard, that alligator swam out, went into the river, and it was never seen again. <laughs> and that's that story. <laughs> that is a story, my goodness, God. Wow, thank you, Antonio. Wow, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> much, <laughs> so many pictures. <laughs> And 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 your uncle's laugh in the end when he was when he realized what he laughing at himself like everybody laughed at, yeah. I have vivid pictures of of the of the alligator seeing that alligator, you know. And I've always had um, I've always had uh, issues with it as, as an adult because the well was big but not really big enough for the alligator. You know, you, you you can't confine a wildlife like that in a tiny thing in the backyard. That's strange, yeah. And then it and then it it flooded, it flooded, and the alligator <laughs> was never seen again. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> oh well. Um, any any crazy stories from your childhood? <laughs> Well, I can tell you about my childhood, but it would never come close to this. Well, I could tell you about Kai, actually, but he's, he could be the alligators in a way. Because well, I'm, I was thinking of when, 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 um, when I was a child, when I was about five years old, my sister got really sick. So my father and mother didn't really have time for me. We lived in a block of flats, a big block of flats. And one of the other f f uh, flats there lived Kai. Chukakai, that means fat Kai. And we we were not nice to him. We were we were really bad to to him. He was he was there and he, he, with his mother alone, and we were not nice at all. We 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 did all kinds of strange things with Kai, but he went came back to us with with really tough. And the way that he was tough was quite bad actually, because I mean, if you did something bad to that, it appear. Uh, yen, yen. So if you said anything bad to him, you, it was quite easy. He just came up to to you. It wasn't serious. He just told you not to. It was quite a serious. He just slapped you in the face. It was really bad. He gave you the beating. It was straightforward. I mean, if you've done something bad, here you got it, right? It was, that was the way. And nobody questioned that. And it was fine. But with Kai, it was different. Because he was on his own, he was never with anyone. So if you said something, or you did something, or he was angry with you, suddenly you realized that he didn't speak to you. It was kind of scary in a way. He avoided you. You came out. There were some guys playing, and suddenly he went away. He he went up to him. I was like, what's going on with this? And the reason he did that was that he was waiting for his punishment. He sort of built it up in his I'm really angry with this guy. And at one point I said something to him, I'd done something, and he was angry with me. He was really, really angry. So I just saw him disappear every time I was around. He was just or he just looked at me with this, I'm gonna get you. And then one, um, it was like now winter, it was November, it's dark outside, you know, at four or something like that, maybe five. I came home with my bike, a little bike I had, and it has to be in the cellar at night. And it was so bad because the cellar was like, you, you press the button, it was like uh, uh, these kind of buttons that you press in and then you hold, then it holds in and then you hear the sound of a and it comes out and that means darkness but next to it is a red spot so you can always find it yeah you could always find it it was really cool I mean, it wasn't cool that it was like the end of the dark the light but it was nice that you had the red the red spots to find and then you could turn on the light but kai was so mean what happened was that one day I came home, fumbled with the keys. I got, the, I was about seven years old or something like that, seven and a half maybe. And I opened the door and then I closed it. I 
press the bottom it's kind of you really have to do an effort to go in there and I came in there with the bikes there was so many bikes I had to find a place I had to place it on the hook I have to lock it and then of course and then the darkness but I was looking around it wasn't that bad I came out in the hall there and then there was all these red lights but at one the one that was closest to me was gone I was like, why? Oh no, Kai. It was because Kai was standing there next to it and holding it so you couldn't see it. And suddenly in the darkness, you heard, I heard him telling me what I'd done wrong. And then he gave me the beating. He was just so mean to me in the darkness. It was horrible to be beaten by that. It really kicked and, and he was really, really hard on you. And then suddenly he was gone. And then I was, you know, bleeding a little bleed. I was like here and that something had happened to my eye. And it was like, it was the worst thing. I went up and my mother asked me what, what had happened. And I said, nothing. I just fell over. It was nothing. And he, she cleaned my face and I, she, she made me go into the bed. We, we slept in a bunk bed. And then she closed the door and she went into the, there was two rooms and I slept with my, my sister, my sick sister. And, and at one point she just asked me what had happened. What, what happened to you? you I mean, you, you look terrible. And then I just said, Chukakai. And then the silence, I remember my sister went like, oh, she knew exactly what had happened. So that's my alligator, it was Chukakai. <laughs> Well, you guys pushed his buttons quite a bit. It sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I must have done something really, really. I was with the others, you know. I was, I was never bright enough, never clever enough to to go against the the tide. If somebody was doing something, I was always part of that. I was not never sort of. Mm, is this right? Actually, I was sort of just following the stream. Like, I mean. We were seven, eight years old, and it was just a question of being there and surviving this strange environment. But yeah. when we when we moved to another place with central heating, um, shower, I had my own room. Everything was sort of. I I, I remember I came out and 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 in this empty place. There was absolutely nobody there, and of course we had the central heating. We had. We had the shower, we had everything, but it never, never was the same as down in that old, you know, neighborhood with all the kids running around and kicking whatever balls over themselves or whatever happened. But Tsukikai was something very, very strange. Wow. So that's my story. That's your story right there. Yes, yeah, childhood. It's an interesting time when you look back. I was teased mercilessly uh, uh, in uh, fifth grade and sixth grade. I was bullied quite a bit. Uh -huh. Yeah, and mercilessly bullied um, as a kid. Um, reason? Huh? I Any stood reason? out. I stood out. I stood out. All he needed to do was stand out. I got. I'm six foot three. I'm. Uh, I'm tall like you are. Um, you know, about six foot three uh, is about 195. Um, yeah, same, same. And I grew very fast, very fast. So when I was in sixth grade, I was the tallest kid in, in, in the classroom. And, um, and I, I stand out, you know, I, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't walk the way kids were supposed to walk. And so I didn't play soccer the way kids played soccer. So I stood out, I didn't fit in. And, uh, um, and I remember one of my uh, most memorable fights actually was with a dear friend of mine and he was not a bully, he was a neighborhood friend. We did not go, we did not go to the same schools. Um, he, was, he lived in a building two two houses removed from where I lived. And um, it's kind of a continuation of the alligator story because eventually I didn't live in an apartment. My mom found a house for us to live in. 
So right away when I was um, eight years old, I was still going to my hometown, but I lived now in a nice home, not in an apartment. And, uh, and I played outside quite a bit, quite a bit. You know, it was not big enough to ride a bicycle, you know, but I played outside quite a bit. And, um, and this friend of mine was from a building, two houses up, very tall apartment building, 24 stories, 24 stories. There was a small town of families in this big building complex. And he lived there. And we uh, started playing outside on the sidewalk. And then I invited him to my yard and he loved the yard. You know, we could do all kinds of things in the yard. There were guava trees and mango trees and papaya and, and avocado trees. And, and, uh, and then we'd disagree on something. We agreed most of the time. But whenever we disagreed on something, he would just stump out of the yard and go back to his apartment. And I would stump up back to the house. But one day, it was, I remember the season, not the weather season, not, the, not, not, July, not summer or winter. I remember it was guava season. And um, you couldn't eat enough guavas. You know, most of them would fall and get rotten, right? They would get all smushed with, with worms in them. And, you know, so the ground underneath the guava trees would get really filled with rotten guavas. And I remember we got into a disagreement and it could have been about anything. It could have been that he thought I was cheating at a game or it could have been that I thought he was cheating at a game. It could have been anything. And we got so angry at each other. And instead of him stomping away and going back home uh, and me stomping away and going back inside, we grabbed handfuls of rotten guavas and we just threw them. And it was like, you know, just, a, you know, just like, you know, there is no consistency. The guavas were mush and had worms in them and would get a handful of them from the ground, not from the tree. The, you know, the, talking about the rotten stuff on the ground. Get a hug, man, you shouldn't have done that. And wham! And I remember the guava, the guava would break in the air and then just hit you like, you know? And, and by the time this was over, it took a while. And when I say a while, it was probably not even five minutes, but just picture two kids at age, you know, 11, throwing guavas at each other for even three minutes, you know, just like, <sighs> and then he stomps out. He stomps away and goes back to the apartment building to this, you know, huge tower. It was 24 stories high. And, um, and what he, uh, he walked back and I walked up to the house because the front yard sat lower than the house. So he had to go up some steps to get to the house. And I walk to the laundry area. I didn't dare go in the house all dirtied with go out, rotten guava. I go to the laundry area and my mom sees me and she was horrified. She was horrified. And she starts to clean me up. She started to clean me up and she said, and what happened to Ernani? His name is Ernani. My friend was named Ernani. Uh, and I said, what where is he? is he? Does he look like you do? I'm like, yeah, he looks pretty much the same way I do. But he went home and my mom got really upset. And I said, why are you upset? And she said, well, you shouldn't send a friend home like this. She was upset that he, my friend's mother was going to receive her son from my mom's home covered in rotten gob. And she said, you should have let him go home. You should have brought him here and I'll clean him up too. <laughs> it's so funny because mom was not upset we had the fight. She was not happy with it. She was not happy we had the fight. But it was far worse that 
one of my friends would go home all covered in rotten guavas and worms. You know? <laughs> That's the worst part of the story. Whenever you say this rotten guava, you, you see these living creatures. On you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh dear, my, my, oops. But you know what's worse than that? No. Is, is Van Eric, you know what's the, you, you know what's worse when you are uh, about eating a guava? You need to say something, go ahead. No, 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 it was my, my, uh, my uh, internet connection was unstable. Go, go. Okay. What is worse than finding a whole worm in a guava? <laughs> finding you know that, a you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, when we talk about beating, come on. My mother was from Norway and she was the best woman in the world. She's best mother. I mean, she was so full of love and I've never doubted, never doubted. I was, I am the best in the world. I'm, I'm the center of the universe. It was never, ever, of, uh -huh. of, of, not in them. She was so full of love to me. But she, she, she did one thing that sort of didn't really work for me. One of the things she said to me, you are not going to hit anyone that, that's shorter than that, that's uh, under your age. Never do that. I was like, oh, all right. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I follow my mother. I, I always did. So uh, in the schoolyard one day, Kenneth, who was living like we were living here in, in in the new block of apartments and he was living in the other end. Uh -huh. And Kenneth, I, know, I didn't really like him and he didn't really like me, but at one point Kenneth in the schoolyard said something to me and I was like, what, 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 what what's going on here? And then he started hitting me, you know, and I was just standing there doing nothing because my mother had told me never to hit anyone that was younger younger than me and i was like i just gave if, and i saw some of the girls charlotte from my class that i really liked and i was so embarrassed but i couldn't do it i was gonna be the one you really like <laughs> yeah yeah exactly why her i mean really that's so bad and then i went home i mean i i wasn't it was not a lot of beating it was just you know a slam or something like that but it was still the embarrassment and all the all the other kids looking at it and charlotte really nice girl but then i told it to helia and helia, helia was older than me and we were playing uh, football in you know in the ground soccer so you know playing a lot of football and then he, he heard this story and he said what what what? Kenneth? Then Lily Lord? <laughs> little guy? You, you, you let him hit you? That's no way. Come on. We're going to, we're going to find a way to tell him that that's not all right. So what we did was that we found one day when again with a bike, he came uh -huh. out with his bike from the, the cellar, the basement. And we waited until the door has locked clock. That meant that oh, he had no. to find the key and he had to open it and then he had to if to get away from us it was a long like like steps going down and he had no way no way he could escape and i just told him that with with Helia standing behind me that's not all right i mean you are not supposed to hit me i'm stronger than you and i'm bigger than you so now i'm just going to hit you and, and i gave him a, a few sort of clap clap just to show that and ever since that day none of the children in the schoolyard i think he just told it like a rumor like came for me because that was the end of it with helia telling me well, I think your your mom is right. You shouldn't hit on younger younger guys, but when they hit you, you hit back. So I did. <laughs> there you go. There I go. <laughs> what a wonderful way to spend forty minutes. I love it, Antonio. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have do you have any comments to sort of wrap up this beautiful event? Any comments that I might have to wrap it up? Um, Gosh, I think it's, um, we need to take it easy on ourselves and, 
and take it easy on everybody. You know, use compassion and know that what makes you hurt makes somebody else hurt too. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, these stories we told today are very much so uh, uh, a good uh, leeway into, into this. You know, we, uh, uh, we tend to ostracize uh, somebody else. You know, and I think it's it's different with with kids, you know, because we're we're still learning and 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 feeling and trying to figure out um, the world. But uh, as adults, we have to uh, step into bigger shoes and realize that what probably makes you hurt will make me hurt. You know, so uh, and what probably makes you happy will make me happy. You know, just the essential things in life. And I wish that uh, we could uh, stop the silliness uh, and the insecurities that leads us to behave as a species uh, the way we've been behaving. Um, and um, I think that there's a lot of good going on in the world. Um, I think humans uh, do a lot of good. But when we decide to do something that's not good, it it, it it seems to be really complicated, you know, and talking about, you know. I, I, I think I will remember this one, the last part of it. Thank you, Antonio, so much. But I well, also will remember when your uncle <laughs> found out what he's been <laughs> shooting. Shooting. His gun. shooting. I got, yeah. what? <laughs> this is this <is> my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Antonio. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much. What a pleasure being with you. Take yeah, care. What a pleasure being with you. Take good care, okay? You too. Thank you. Bye.